he gave me, but um, a handful of my friends in this room lost a sweet friend this week. She left behind a God-fearing husband and four children, including a four-month-old baby. So today I feel very sober-minded that my life is not my own and I can't afford to live for this world. She's certainly with Jesus in eternity, but there are millions who don't know yet how divine and profound that choice is because most of the church has been silent. These people on the streets are not coming into our church buildings. They're waiting for you to leave the church building. There is hope in this message, but I'm going to have to be really real about the darkness. Thank you, Julie. So bear with me. We're in a time of war spiritually right now. This isn't a time to retreat and hang back and throw out some prayers here and there. There are men genuinely believing they are women. There are adults meant to protect small children trying to perversely allow children to be the gender they choose as a little kid when they aren't even allowed to drink alcohol, purchase cigarettes, or buy lottery tickets, or go to an R-rated movie by themselves yet. But they can change their body parts forever, even before they're fully formed, and people are trying to pass bills where the child is removed from parents who don't allow this. There are pastors preaching the gospel saying that Jesus helped Lazarus come out as a gay man as they read the portion of Jesus calling Lazarus out of the grave because somehow they genuinely have made the word fit their deceived lifestyle rather than allowing it to mean what it truly meant. Our Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and was calling him out of the tomb. There are broken men and women coming into a church seeking freedom all to discover a building without the presence of God and people who have no idea how to help disciple, love them, and call them into their true nature as sons and daughters of God. However, this is their true idea of Christianity because it's what they're being shown. And then they go out on the streets where a demonized generation is discipling them into organizations that accept a lawless and perverted theology that leads to depression, deception, and anguish and begins to turn them against Christ and into the kingdom of hell. According to a 2016 report from the trend of forecasting agency, blah, 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 just 48% of Americans, are you so proud of me, Dina, for quoting? It's my professor. Uh, just 48% of Americans aged 13 to 20 identified as exclusively heterosexual. 48% of Americans, hear this, age 13, this isn't 2016, 13 to 20 identified exclusively as heterosexual compared to the 65% of those aged 21 to 34. I hope you're listening. Another article states that 3.1% of Americans identify as bisexual, 1.4% as gay, 0.7% as lesbian, and 0.6% as transgender. In 2020, research showed that 7 out of 10 Americans could center themselves Christians. Are you hearing the percentage difference here? Do you want me to rewind just a little bit? 3.1% of Americans identify as bisexual. Listen to the percentage. 1.4% as gay, 0.7% as lesbian, 0.6% as transgender. This mama bear is not asleep, just so you know right now. And 7 out of 10, 70% Amer of Americans proclaim to be Christians. So my question to you is this. Why is this less than 5% of American culture leading the narrative right now over the 70%? Where are the mothers who nurture, raise up, exhort, empower, and remind children of who they are? I can tell you why. Is this intense? Great. Okay, lukewarm Christianity. It's running rampant in the church because men and women are not being taught the absolute beauty of repentance and forgiveness. They aren't encountering the presence of God as much as they are the fancy lights, the smoke machines, the fashionable preachers, and famous worship leaders. I know that this isn't true everywhere, but I just have to call it for what it is. Righteous, holy, and set-apart Christians shouldn't be rare, but they are. And I'm believing this is because many of us aren't obeying God's word to make disciples of all nations. A true disciple is one who obeys God's word, period. It's, it's what Jesus said. True disciples read, listen, and obey. There's a generation crying out for hope, and you are carrying it. Will you speak up? Brandy and I were in Nashville um, a couple months ago, and our Uber driver gets out of the car to come drive us, and just giving, so I don't know why people think this is an extreme example, it was so fun, but he got out of the car to help put our bags in, tattoos all over his face, and I'm like, this bro's in a gang, or this bro is like a Satanist, and I was like, yeah, when he got out of the car, because I was like, he got 20 minutes in the car with us, <laughs> and so 
we get in the car. We're like, what's your name? He's like, Xavier. I'm totally going to summarize this. And Brandy and I are like, what do you like to do, Xavier? Right out the gate, his Lord. Are you ready? Hungry and his Lord. Are you ready? Oh, man, I used to be a Satanist. But, you know, that was, like, so dark and it was so hard. And then it was like, you know, then I became, like, a witch, but, like, a white witch, not the dark kind. You know, not the bad kind, the good kind. And then it's so cool because I'm totally, like, summarizing this and then he's like and I went to this Pentecostal church and we're like yeah we know them and he's like and they let me lay hands on somebody and they got delivered while in white witchcraft shows up to a Pentecostal church the Lord shows him he can deliver someone but he's hungry and we're like oh cool so why why are you so into that why are you so passionate about it and he's like because I want to see souls set free and we're like that is so cool that's why we're here we flew into town to set souls free. We get to do that for a living. He's like, yeah. And we had this moment where we got to be really real, like, hey, Xavier. Also, he had a, a very thin cross tattoo on his forehead that used to be upside down and got turned upside down. I just want you to know, I don't see anybody in this room with that on their face, but this is the harvest. They have upside down crosses on their forehead right now. They have no authority over you. And one day that cross will turn upright if you open up your mouth. Do you hear me? I know it's intense. I have a lot of joy and love, but I don't get the fluffy words that I get to deliver, okay? But I'm also like, I'm a mama right now, and I ain't messing around because there are Xavier's walking out there. So we got to minister to Xavier. Xavier gets out of the car. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We tell him to get rid of all the witchcraft. And I'm like, bro, witchcraft is witchcraft. It's all Satan. Seek Jesus. Read the word. Dive in. Don't touch your witchcraft and see what happens. I said, because I believe you have this call. He was passionate about rap music. He wanted to be famous. And we're like, yeah, we believe the Lord put that in you because you're called to be. I said, I believe that you're going to be preaching with Brandy and I one day. If you seek first the kingdom of heaven, read the word of God and seek Jesus with all your heart. He starts crying because his true identity is being spoken over him. He starts crying. You can tell the hotel people, the men are literally so uneasy because of Xavier's looks. And they're trying to protect me and Brandy. Are you catching me? And we're like, oh no, bro. And I'm like, and we're praying for Xavier. The one thing I wish I would have done was gotten his contact information. But we're praying for him and he's crying. We're praying for the spirit of God to come upon him and lead him. And we're calling him out. We're saying, yeah, God put that in you. But you can't have it with mixture. This is the harvest. It doesn't look like the cute, perfect, polished person showing up at your church on Sunday. And I'm all about church on Sunday. I love my church. I also love how radical my church is. It doesn't stay in the four walls. When the ruler of the world comes to kill, steal, and destroy, it's an opportunity to see where you really stand and what you really believe in, i.e., Xavier's your Uber driver, and you're like, oh, bless, bless his heart. All them Texans, oh, bless his heart. And you're just trying not to wet your pants in the car because you're so scared. <laughs> Lord, because you have no idea how much authority you have. And Xavier has all these tattoos. And he, oh, my Lord. So you're quiet. Instead of taking a 20-minute opportunity. So when opportunity presents itself, it's too late to prepare. Are you going to speak or are you going to be silent? Because there are a lot of Xavier's walking around. They don't know how tattoos on their face a lot of people do right now but they don't all have it so in these moments what I love and this I love correction I love when the kindness of God comes upon me and corrects me because I want to be holy and I want to be set apart and I really mean it and I call it hurt so good I'm going to write a book called hurt so good one day because I love it when my friends come to me and it hurts so good in the moment but I know they love me and they're helping me grow if you're my friend I've probably come to you and done it But I get to see where I really stand. Oh, God, I really missed an opportunity with you. And I'm not going to feel guilt and shame, but like, Lord, how can I minister to Xavier without being afraid? But some of us don't even know we're doing it because we're so desensitized to the Holy Spirit right now. And I, there's no guilt or shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm assuming if you showed up, you love Jesus in some form or another, okay? And there's no shame. When he comes, his kindness leads you to repentance, not his not his loathing, anger, and hatred for you. He is not like that. He is kind. He is like, this makes no sense. Some of you, I really hope and pray in Jesus' name that, that this word just hits you. But 70% of our nation is Christian. 
and somehow 3%, less than 5% of our nation is leading the narrative in the entertainment, in arts, in media. Quite frankly, in the church, too. So let's be real about godlessness in this hour. The enemy is after any woman who has any part of her life in sin. 2 Timothy 3. But understand this, that in the last days, as I read this too, I just want you to be really real. This is like how I read the word of God. <laughs> I'm like, man, that hurts so good, God. I just want you to hear the Holy Spirit when I read this. And just be really real. Holy Spirit, are you touching any of this in me this weekend? Do you want to set me free of any of this? Am I unaware? Do I need, are you, like, open my eyes to see if I'm living in a godlessness way. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. This is one of the last epistles that Paul wrote. Paul is my, that is my dude. Like, I love how direct he is. I love how black and white he is. I love how he went from, like, killing Christians to, like, talk about repentance and forgiveness. Murdering Christians, God comes upon him, he repents, and he is, we read, like, he is why I know Jesus like I do because of what he wrote. Like, God used him, and he's so cool. Is he not, like, so cool? Like, legit, I, I can't wait to hang out with this bro. Okay, I don't want to distract you from <laughs> the word. It says, avoid such people. This is where I want you to hear this too. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women. For among all of those people are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning always showing up to the conference, always doing the online mentorship, always listening to the podcast, always reading the next book, and never able to arrive at knowledge of the truth. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was of the two men, Janus and Jambres, who's, you know, the witchcraft dudes with Moses. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. This is... 2 Timothy 3, it's a steak. It's good to eat. I love the word of God. This is what I want to address. First of all, repentance. Many of us in this room are living this way. At our retreat this year, I had a word of knowledge that some people were being verbally abusive, and abusive is one of these, that they were being verbally abusive to their children and their husband or somebody in their family. Oftentimes people aren't aware that they're being verbally abusive when they are. It's very shocking. Um, slanderous, defaming people behind their back. I mean, this is crazy, not loving good. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Did you know that there's power in godliness? There's signs, wonders, and miracles that come. Jesus said you would do that when you become a disciple of him. But this is what's so crazy, is all of these people, when you let them in your house and you have an open door, creep into your house and they capture you, burdened with sin and led astray by various passions. And I don't, I don't want to see any weak woman. You know, like... I want to have so much discernment that I don't let I, I don't let anybody like that in my house. I'll bless you. I'll do deliverance ministry. Like, we'll go after it. But do you hear what I'm saying? And some of us have opened the door to sin in our life. And the beautiful thing is, is God is just saying, will you just turn to me and let me strengthen you? Will you just take ownership and repent? And let me, like, show you who you really are. Like, Xavier, in white witchcraft. Do, 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 do. And it's like, no, Xavier. <laughs> This is who you are. Tears. Oh, my goodness. Crazy encounter. God wants to do that with you. We're all Xavier. That's what shock. That's, this is where the religious spirit is going to come up in some of you. We are all Xavier. 
that were set free because we got to repent and turn to God. And now we want the world to know what we have because we used to be like Xavier. And God came and chased us down. This is the God that we serve. James 4, 4, really light reading, really fun scriptures. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Man, in my young days, I was in competitive cheerleading. I watched young men turn. I, re I realize that there are children in the room. But do you understand what I'm saying? I watched young men turn out of their identity into something else. They were not born that way. I watched it happen. And I want you to know that if you're sitting in this room and you are affirming homosexuality or sin in somebody's life, you are at just as much fault, and I'm asking you to pick up the word of God and obey it. I'm not asking you to come after them and slander them. I'm asking you to stand your ground and let them know hell is real. It is fiery. It is lethal. It is a foul place that nobody wants to go to. People that have had near-death experiences that share about hell, whether it's true or not, I really believe it's that bad, if not worse. Hell is a real place. Our friend passed away this week. I kind of have the fear of the Lord over me because she's my age that like I don't know how long I have, but I don't want people to go to hell because I know I'm not going there. And I'm not willing to coddle the world and become at enmity with God because I so don't want to, because I have the fear of man or like, oh, Roe v. Wade's overturned. Oh, oh, but all these women who are sleeping around and that's how you get pregnant are killing babies so they can keep sleeping around, but when you sleep around, you can get pregnant. Like it just does, do you hear what I'm saying? It just doesn't like compute with me. And I know some of you are maybe getting a little, but will you hear me? Murdering babies is never the answer. It is a baby. It is a human being. We literally have doctors. When you show up to the doctor's office, the ones who are literally trained, that are so deceived, you can see it on their badge, he, they, them, she. I went to the doctor the other day, and they were like, what were you born as? What do you consider yourself? I'm sorry, is this a hospital? Deceived. Do you understand? W w how did we get here? Silence? Complacency? Apathy? And I'm just, I'm done. I'm just done. Are you done? I'm done. But I don't want to sit in this room and be like, yeah, girl, what's up? And then you go home and keep living the same way and not do anything. There's so many things we can actually do. Prayer is so important, but in the place of prayer, God speaks to you, and he sends you out to make a difference. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This makes me think of just like sin in our life. Some of us have struggled with addictive behavior. You get set free from one addiction, you move to the next. And you're like, oh, I got delivered, but then somehow you're moved on to the next thing. You can't serve both gods. There's a spirit that's trying to keep you from the love of God, and he loves you too much to let you stay there. But the thing is, he's just saying, oh, I hope this is okay. You can correct me later if this isn't okay. I was teaching an online class this year, and I had a moment where I, um, there, was, there was plagiarism. So I had to hop on with the other professor, and we had to have a Zoom call. And what's so cool is me and the other professor, spirit-filled Christians. And all this person had to do is just, like, confess. Because on the back end, you can see very clearly what happened. And I felt like in that moment, God was allowing me to experience his heart, for his desire for us to repent. Because I knew the outcome if she came clean, and I knew the outcome if she didn't. And I was on the edge of my seat, shaking, having to stay professional. Were you shaking? No? Were you just, you kept it cool? Okay. Um, shaking just like God, like interceding, like praying in tongues in my head. <laughs> and the spirit of the Lord came upon the other professor to ask a question that, that brought the kindness of God that allowed her to confess and repent. And so the outcome was beautiful. She wasn't even punished for it because she confessed. 
that's how God rolls. He's on the edge of his seat saying, baby girl, I see you. Will you just turn to me? Just confess. Yes, I did this. You have to do that. <laughs> confess. Like, I did this. I'm so sorry. I take ownership of it. And then he wipes you clean. And then you learn never to do it again. <laughs> I don't want to go back there. Hopefully, we've learned never to do it again. Praying for this event this weekend, I heard this. These serpents in your life have masked themselves with such beauty. Many haven't cast them to their belly yet to see them for what they really are, or you wouldn't have anything to do with them. No one wants a poisonous snake in their bed or in their home. Sin comes beautifully packaged by the world. So beautiful, so handsome. Urgh. It does, it does. It's why it's called temptation. Do you, under, do you get it? Like it is tempting. And just because you're tempted does not mean you're in sin, but it's what you do when the opportunity of temptation presents itself that reveals where you really are. Do I have authority or am I not? Like, do I recognize this really deceptive package for what it is? Some of you are operating in consistent sin. And I know this because we've been praying. <laughs> I'm not standing up here trying to accuse anybody. But we've really been praying for this event. And the Lord said people are going to get set free from, like, cycles of sin. It is not beautiful what you're holding on to. The romance novels that lead to a whole lot of other sinful things in your life, that handsome man on the cover, you need to cast him to his belly for what he is. Do you understand what I'm saying? You need to curse that foul thing to the ground. And don't you ever pick that foul thing up again. And you need to get in community so we can hold you accountable and love you through it. Are you willing to crucify that part of your flesh and just kill it by the blood of the lamb? All scripture is breathed out by God. I love this scripture. People always just read the last part, but Paul is talking about, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life. I love reading about persecution. We were talking about it at dinner last night, and I was like, come on. I had to sit back and breathe. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue. And what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, righteousness. That the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. This is the second part of the godlessness scripture I was reading to you earlier. It's a blueprint. I even highlighted it in blue. All scripture is breathed out by God. It literally, his, his word, his word. Are you in his word? I'm telling you, his word has saved me. It has rescued me. I've read his word and repented, not even realizing I was in sin. And I'm so grateful for the word of God. Because it teaches me in the secret place. And let me tell you something about, let me tell you something about conviction, okay? He will come to you in that secret place. If you aren't listening, he's going to come to you through a friend or somebody you really don't care to hear it through. Pride comes before the fall. So how do you want to do this? He's so kind to come to you in the secret place one-on-one. -on -one. Is that not amazing? This is our God. Our God doesn't put you on a stage and say, blasphemy. <laughs> you had a critical thought. You're going to hell. He says, hey, was that my thought towards them? <laughs> You're like, nope. You're right, God. I'm so sorry. Some of you might be repenting towards me right now. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Um, but he, he just, God, no. It's probably going to happen a lot. Um, but you're like, God, <laughs> I don't know, somebody, somebody just got delivered. <laughs> Pow! <laughs> somebody just woke up. <laughs> awake, oh, sleeper. <laughs> Are you awake in the back, Mom? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. God's word helps us stay on the path of holiness and teaches us how to truly live set apart for him. Our faith is going to get tested and pushed up against, and we can't afford to have sin hidden in our lives. There's more more persecution coming, real persecution. Are you coming? We were talking about this last night. Hear me out. I know we're all in different places in life. I feel like I just did like a Catholic thing. 
Um, I don't consider trolling online persecution. <laughs> this is coming from the person who, who went somewhere on J6 to pray. Nobody asked me that. I received so much persecution from people I knew and loved. It was very painful. I found myself in the fetal position in the prayer room at our house, crying, obeying the word of God, by name, blessing every single one of them until I knew I really forgave them. It probably took three days. I'm just going to be real. Also, I'm like looking at somebody who's probably one of the most persecuted people I know in this room. I've seen somebody in here go through some real persecution, and yet they still turn to the Lord. All false things written about them, slandered all over the global news, yet they still stand and say, but God, because they know that's not who they are. I'm sure there's tears, but God. But I'm talking like somebody trolls you and they're like, la, 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 on your social media post, and then you go to a cave for like four days or for four years because you never want to see yourself on Facebook again because somebody hurt your feelings. Your feelings matter. I love you. Can you get in the word of God and take authority and just realize that person's really hurt, doesn't know you, and it's just social media? Do you understand? But, like, persecution is coming where we will see Christians murdered on the streets in America. I personally would like to be so clean and holy and pure that I am a life worthy of being persecuted. I'm not, like, welcoming that in my life. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not, like, looking for it. But people who live for Christ will be persecuted. If you haven't yet been persecuted, what you doing? I don't know. It just seems like a little blueprint to me. Does this make sense? I don't want to say something theologically off. One of my spiritual moms or real moms can get up here and be like, yeah, what's up? My mother-in-law, my mom, or my spiritual mom. Okay. Just want to clarify. Um, does this make sense? <laughs> Thank you. Blessed are those, Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, or in the same way they persecuted the, or in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Why am I talking about persecution? Because sin keeps you desensitized to the power and joy. Are you ready? You're going to be like, who is this girl? The power and joy of experiencing the cup of suffering and joy that comes with truly following Christ. You aren't going to get persecuted looking like the world. But you will be when you're truly living set apart for Christ. And what an honor. What an honor on the other side when you turn to the Lord and allow him to strengthen you in that time of weakness. I used to work at a church where we were, like, under fire with, like, we were in the neighborhood of Dallas, and at staff meetings every week, we just got updates, and we would, like, like, fire department came in to close on the prayer room, and we would, like, stand in our chairs, and we'd be like, yeah, thank you, Jesus, because we knew we must have been doing something right if the city was coming so hard after us for praying for them. We celebrated the junk that was coming at us. People are going to come at you for following Christ. If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Isn't this so kind and beautiful? <laughs> Nobody wants to be hated. It's not fun. But when you get yourself in a community of like-minded, holy, reverent, fear of God women, there's nothing like it. The fruit that I've seen in women who were literally just like, I'm so tired of the world and come around set apart women and they come to my house every other Sunday night or they're coming to our events or we're online together and we're ministering with one another. The fruit in their life is so beautiful that you will become the, the thing that you're around the most. But there's hope, y'all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How amazing is that? So all of this, I know we're talking about it, and it's like, look, to live a set-apart life is not to be weaksauce.com. He is strength in your weakness. Do you following me? Like, he will be your strength in your weakness, but I don't, he's not talking about you being weak sauce. He, and I mean lukewarm. You can't have your foot in the world and your foot in the Bible and expect to see any fruit from that. That's in my Bible. It's just, 
I translated it differently just then for you. Our God is unlike anything else in the world. His love wipes us clean from all of our sins and mishaps. If we just turn to him fully, it's like 100% on us. He puts the ball in our court every time because he doesn't force anything upon us like that. If you're battling big sin right now, my question for you is, when is the last time you truly encountered Jesus? And is he really real to you? Because he's not this felt bored, cute character that many of you learned about in elementary school. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Am I like too old? Gen Z's probably like, what are you talking about? We had a felt board in <laughs> elementary school at Bible church where they would like throw the Bible characters on there because we didn't have media yet. <laughs> Very creative. It, and, and it sure did. It's still here. Oh, shout it. <laughs> Okay, but he's not a felt board. He's like real. Yeah? Like he's really real. Like he actually does the things we learned about when we were little. It's not some like hypothetical thing. It's wild. And the more informed I am, the more courageous I am. And who he is and who I am and what his word says. And when temptation comes, I swat it away through Jesus. Is that not so? You know how liberating it is to swat temptation away? Be like, feet because you know what it was like when it wasn't under your feet and you know you didn't do it he did it when opportunity presents itself it's too late to prepare opportunity good or bad it's one of my favorite sayings it's easy to say the holy things but will you live them when opportunity comes whether tragic or amazing I've had the opportunity to stand for resurrection life this within the past year and it doesn't mean there weren't tears, and it doesn't mean there wasn't difficulty, right? But God's word says that when we lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, and that we can raise the dead. And I just don't understand. We were talking about this at dinner last night, and somebody's going to get way further into this. It's going to be great. There are certain sins that I'm like, okay, his word says that he can raise the dead, but you don't believe he can deliver you from depression. I was delivered from depression. I was off and on for 15 years. It was not fun, and I knew it wasn't from God, and I'll never forget the day I was delivered. But, like, why do you think you can't be delivered from depression? Be oh, oh, because the doctors told you you can't. I know I'm offending people right now because I would have been offended when I was sitting in depression. I hope you hear my heart. I would have been offended that it wasn't a chemical imbalance. You have a sound mind in Christ, and his word leads you, teaches you, guides you, and sets you free. But if the word's not in you, how can you even know? You literally don't know until you know. No one can make you obey God. You can only go along with someone on the journey with true obedience. And I love obedience to God. Sometimes it's just really hard, and I don't want to do it, but there's always fruit on the other side. Sometimes I don't do it, and I have to repent, and I'm really bummed from the missed opportunity. I'm not going to stand up here acting like I'm, like, perfect and have my whole life together. My husband's also in the back listening, so. <laughs> yeah. So his kindness leads us to repentance. And this is what I've come to learn about repentance and living set apart. There's six things that the Holy Spirit walked me through. One, when I feel conviction from sin, it means that God is in the room with me. You're in the present. When conviction comes, you're in the presence of the Holy One. When you're in sin and Satan's in the room, shame comes upon you. And just remember, you have full access to the presence of God if you turn to him. Even when you feel the shame and guilt in the presence of the, the evil one, do you hear me? There's two options. There's two kingdoms here. And it's all our choice. Nobody else is choosing for you. People don't like to hear that, but some people do, but it's so easy. Second, when I feel conviction, it means he's in the room, but then he's reminding me of who I am in that moment. It's like, oh, Jamie Lynn, that's not who you are. But Satan tries to say, oh, this is who you are. It's just the way it's going to be. And then I turn my heart back to God, but Satan says, I want you to run away. You can never go back. It's so embarrassing. Hide. Don't go back. And God's like, no, just turn to me. So I'm turning back to him. And then I'm apologizing and I'm taking ownership. I'm confessing with my mouth out loud and in my heart in a real place of grief. Like, a real, like he will come and help you. Like the Holy Spirit will let you feel his grief for that sin. 
and I'm apologizing and I'm taking ownership, but Satan wants me to stay there and be silent and hide from everybody and don't, not tell anybody. And then God, when I'm apologizing and taking ownership, he's revealing another way for me to go. There's always an escape route. I think it's like 1 Corinthians 13. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna finish that because I don't remember exactly where it is. But he says there's no temptation that he brings you where he doesn't provide an escape route for you. An escape route, like an exit sign on the door to escape the temptation, to escape the sin. This is our God. I mean, this is really profound to me. And then when I go away after repenting and turning to the God and I start to God and I start walking towards him, my favorite part, Satan loses. He loses every single time. He thought he had me, but he didn't. He thought he had Jesus, but three days later. Every time you repent, Satan loses. He thinks he has you. He only has you if you let him have you. That's what's so wild. One of the first messages John the Baptist preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Daily repentance, Matthew 3, 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. This is me. I like repent randomly. I would say nearly daily for things. I'm just like, oh, Lord, so sorry. That's not who I am. Forgive me. I love you. Like, I'm a repent queen, and I'm not doing it with the purpose of sinning. Do you know what I'm saying? And some people would even think what I'm repenting for isn't sin. But, like, I just want a clean, pure heart, and I'm not trying to make some method, some weird, like, blueprint where it has to look like this. I'm just in relationship with the Father. I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and I respond to him. It's just so gentle. I mean, it's not like, turn or burn. It is. It is. Okay? But it's not. He wants you to bear fruit from his kingdom, which is love. Some of you might be like, I want that. I don't feel like I have that right now. But you have access to it literally right now. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit of the life of one who is yoked to the spirit of God. And it's, look, I, I have been liberated. You are looking at a woman who has been liberated from critical thoughts towards you, from really critical thoughts towards herself. I did not know you could be so kind towards people in your head and in your heart until he totally, totally changed me and set me free. It is so liberating. You used to struggle with anger. Oh, my goodness. 10 out of 10, clap back. Ha! Not anymore. And so when I see people that struggle with anger, my heart grieves because I can't own, I remember the anguish and the pain and the hurt because there's some deep hurt there and they're popping off at people and it hurts people so bad. And I'm like, oh, I want them to be free. I remember that. And it grieves me. And some of you probably struggle with anger in this room. And God, that is not your inheritance through Christ Jesus. And I'm telling you, someone who used to battle anger, I'm telling you, Thank you, Jesus, too, that you gave me a husband who literally has never yelled at me and is so gentle and kind, and it feels so safe and beautiful. But are you hearing? Like, he does this. He wants to do this for you. His fruit of the Spirit is within you. Okay, three things that help you stay free, and then we're going to... One, walking house of prayer. I had a dream one time where Heidi Baker, who's clearly Jesus, <laughs> came up to me and was like, everywhere you go, you're going to establish a house of prayer, because you are a walking house of prayer. And I love that. It's like you don't have to show up to a prayer meeting to get your prayer in. You don't have to go to your prayer closet. You should. These are great things to do. Hear me out. You can be praying while you walk into the bathroom, <laughs> while you're driving your car. You're a walking house of prayer, driving house of prayer. It's amazing. You're in relationship with God. You're communing with God when you pray. It's literally a... Uh, Back and forth dialogue with God, listening, responding, listening, respond. Some of y'all just like, and you're not seeing any change because you haven't. The word of God is the second thing. I mean, these are so basic, okay? It's like the three-step obvious to getting healthy, okay? Word of God brings direction and correction. Get up in that thing. I love it. I love reading the word of God. Man, I usually read it like right before bed. And I'm like, oh, man, thanks, God. Or I'm just like, ooh, 
I don't know what it's going to turn into, but I love the word of God. He is the word of God. It is alive and active today for now. It wasn't written back then so that all those people could just learn about what had happened. It's literally for you right now. Like some of you are like, I don't know what to do. And God's like, open your word, open my word, the word, open me up and read and you will find your answer. It's just so simple. It's so simple. Community. It helps you stay victorious and overcome. A lot of you know it because we all run together. This ministry has like totally changed my life community wise. Like I'm telling you, it's phenomenal. I have women at my house every other week to pray and to just break bread. We eat dinner together. We cry. We pray. People have got delivered in my house. So wild. So crazy what God has done. I'm so honored what God has done within the walls of the house because of what happened at the table in community. So you need to pray. You need to read that word. And you need to get in community. And those three are the triple threat, I'm telling you right now, to living a life set apart and free from sin. And you need to not hide. You need to not be silent. You need to be real. And if people think your sin is too weird to help you be set free and walk through it, find another community. But if you know you're in sin, stop sinning. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, you obey his word. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, you obey his word. So we need courage to obey his word and go. You cannot stay in your home and expect to see people saved. Noah built the ark. Esther went before the government. Jesus went to the cross. Mary said, little baby nugget Mary, let your will be done through me. Carried it through. The disciples stayed true to Jesus' teachings unto death. He was so real to them unto death. We aren't challenged like that in America. But when you stay close to the Holy Spirit, you can be. And it is an honor to be challenged unto death. There are people in other countries being martyred every day. It's not happening too crazy in America. And I'm really hoping this 70% wakes up. But if you have sin in your life, it it desensitizes you and it makes you complacent and apathetic towards living set apart. And I just want you to be free. So... If you're lost, can you get back to the place where you fall in love with Jesus again and where you discover he's so much more valuable than anything this world gives to us? America needs you. Will you answer the call? I could drop the mic and walk off, but we about to repent. (laughs) Will you answer the call? Are you going to let the 5% run the nation? Are you going to wake up? (laughs) Candace, I saw that. Do you hear me? Are we good? We out there? So this is what this is going to look like. It's so simple. We don't need some like shake and bake thing. If that's the way the Holy Spirit comes upon you, great. This is just when I say this room is like an altar, okay? This isn't like, oh, I'm going to hype you up right now. We're going to make this emotional thing, and then you're going to leave, and you're not going to be changed. This is what I'm asking of you. If something came to your mind via the Holy Spirit during this time, and you feel that you need to repent for something, repent. Come to the front. Go to the sides, go to the aisle, go to the back of the room. Right now, do it now. This is Repentance is not like, oh, yeah, tomorrow at 10 a.m., I'm going to schedule a session with God, and I'm going to, you may not make it to 10 a.m. tomorrow, honey. So what's so beautiful is I feel all of you, well, not all of you, many of you have said, who have come up to me, there's so much peace. There's so much peace up here. I feel the peace of God, and I feel the kindness of God. And the kindness of God is not like, yeah, he's just there with you. And you know what he's saying, but this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you if there's something you feel you need to repent for. Maybe you've been quiet in our nation. Maybe you shrunk back and you didn't obey God because somebody hurt you and you need to forgive. Jesus said that we would preach repentance and forgiveness as his disciples. Those two things. We would go into the world making disciples of all nations, baptizing them, Father, Son, Holy Spirit teaching them to obey his word. He also says, preach repentance and forgiveness towards the end of his life. Very important. So if you need to forgive somebody, if you need to receive the Lord's forgiveness by repenting, I want you to get out of your chair and go somewhere and have this moment with God for the next couple of minutes. All you do is say, Lord, I repent, but please mean it. I'm not the kind of person that like wants everybody to get up and run to the altar if you don't mean it. You know what I'm saying? 
like there's a grievance that comes upon you where you're like, I can't carry this sin anymore. I can't handle this anymore. I can't handle gluttony anymore. I can't handle coffee addiction. I can't handle vaping anymore. I can't handle masturbation anymore. I can't handle pornography anymore. I can't handle this self-hatred anymore. I can't handle this critical spirit anymore. I mean, all these things lead to death. It's just not life in your body. So if you can't handle it anymore, I want you to stand up and I want you to go somewhere in the room and you don't have to do it where we can hear you. you can, but go confess and invite the Holy Spirit to come in and make you clean. And from this point forward, you ask the Holy Spirit to help you walk it out. Mm -hmm.